Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host as always, Steve Hall. And today I'm very excited to have Coach Kasim back on the show and also Jacob Templar. So these guys both have a lot of expertise to come into this discussion, which I'm really excited to talk about because it's something that's obviously close to a lot of bodybuilders' hearts. And I think it's becoming quite a catchy term at the moment, at least. Um, and some of these terms that we're going to be talking about have come a bit catchy. And I think it just warrants a further discussion on what they mean, what they actually are, what it might mean for different goals and individuals. Uh, so Kasim is obviously head of N1, which is all about biomechanics and uh, getting the most out of movements and kind of N1 is very much specific to the individual. So um, he has a great amount of knowledge to give to that. And then Jacob is obviously a doctor in physiotherapy. So uh, a lot of these terms we'll be talking about kind of centered around physio physiotherapy and um, you probably use some of them within your practice, I'm sure. And so I thought it'd be great to get them both on because maybe there's some disagreements or maybe they're just different terminologies used and i think like you already talked about off air it's probably going to be a lot of agreement which i think is going to be uh, beneficial for the most part as well so i don't know if kasim you want to start to talk and define so we have like an, a, an agreement on terms kind of probably the three big ones that people hear about uh full range of motion first of all what even is full range of motion i guess maybe in a uh when going through a research study what do they mean if they say they use full range of motion or movements uh, passive range of motion and then active range of motion and then we can dig into some more nuance from there cool yeah so i think the biggest thing for full range of motion is understanding full range of what is is gonna is gonna be key right so an exercise can have a range of motion um, a joint can have a certain amount of range of motion and then a particular muscle may be able to operate within a specific range that is you know only a part of that joint's range of motion so when we look at like a, a research on say comparing different squats they're not necessarily saying well this is full range of motion for the quad they're saying well this is the full range of motion for the squat and they'll set the parameters for whatever knee and, and hip flexion uh, may occur but that may not be the full range of motion at the knee that you would achieve at a different exercise or, or whatnot so when it comes to hypertrophy oftentimes you know when we take when we approach an exercise we're approaching it with a specific muscle or a group of muscles in mind um, and so i think a, a good take home point you know in terms of context is always to think of like how much of the muscles range of motion do i achieve in this exercise is an important programming factor right and then that can help you decide within that exercises range of motion do i need to use the entire range of motion that's available to me in that exercise or is there going to be a more effective space within that that's more more targeted right and so then your training goal could be if it's very isolated, it's a smaller range of motion that's more effective, or if it's very broad, or if it's a sport specific or whatnot, it may have nothing to do with the muscle. It may be I need to go from point A to point B because I'm a power lifter and these are the these are the parameters that the sport uh, has set for me, right? Um, or I'm doing this in an integrated, non-isolated fashion, and so I'm literally just trying to improve my coordination of this. So when we talk about full range of motion, it's important that we kind of clarify full range of what because it's going to be different in terms of an exercise, the joints uh, capacity versus an individual muscles capacity, right? I don't know if Jacob wants to add any context to that or. Yeah, I mean, like when we talk about, because obviously the articular surfaces have different abilities, like I see in the clinic, like <clears throat> some people can achieve, say, in their knee, like a certain degree of flexion. Um, but others can't because maybe their calf is a certain size or their thigh is a certain size. So even though the joint can move technically, like if we didn't have all that stuff to this certain degree, or maybe articularly, you can do it in a functional position because of other factors, you may have limitations in your range of motion, or, um, there are times even when people need to be like in a sport specific context to achieve certain ranges of motion at times, but say just walking around, they might not get into this certain position um, on a daily basis that makes a difference on the context. Um, as well as like he said, like for hypertrophy, there's going to be times where specifically you want to target a muscle in a certain way. And 
doing an exercise in a particular fashion may target uh, same like um, like a bicep curl or like a row, there's ways you can do those to isolate and try and focus more attention towards like a specific muscle group more than another. Fantastic. I don't know if active you want to. Active versus passive. So yeah, dive into active versus passive. But I thought that's a actually a really useful kind of demonstration of where you can't just say to someone full range of motion. It's kind of like full range of motion for what what goal. And I think yeah. probably good point in the podcast just to say if we focus on hypertrophy at least because that's what this podcast is generally about, mm-hmm. just physique development, um, not the context like powerlifting and other sports. But yeah. feel free to use those as examples to kind of demonstrate things yeah. for sure. Mm-hmm. You know, and maybe this would be a good time to do like a two-minute recap on the research because you could do it in two minutes because there's not that much on full range versus versus partial range of motion. And they, I think uh, Greg did a, a, a review on uh, a review on a meta-analysis of mass not too long ago or whatever. Um, but I know a lot of people have, have blindly made the claim that full range of motion is superior. Um, and the research absolutely does not like support like, oh yeah, full range of motion is, is always better because I think of the major studies you have uh, around a third of them that actually showed positive results in uh, partial range of motion as being more effective for the, the hypertrophy's sake. Um, and then you had a few nulls and then you had some that showed greater range of motion. And if you look deeper into those, what you'll notice is the studies that showed better uh, results in full range of motion versus partials is that in those cases, the partial range of motion often takes out the most significant portion of the exercise, like the bottom of the squat or the bottom of the bench press. So you see those exercises and they're like, oh yeah, full range of motion is better. But I mean, everybody knows like, the juice is at the bottom of the squat, right? It's not, not at the top. Um, so when you look at the study where they did like the partial squat, but they added more load, then the quad hypertrophy was essentially uh, the same. And, and a little important caveat on there is that the, the glutes actually did better in the full still than the partial, but there's a mechanical thing where if it's like, if I'm doing a heavy partial squat, I'm not going to get a full challenge in my glutes because my knees are going to be the limiting factor. Uh, and that. it's just not the same biomechanics the bottom of the squat versus doing the uh, the partial squat that they did. So either they weight equ- the weight or load equated for the quads, but it was not load equated for the glutes based off of the mechanics they were using. So I think that's just an important caveat to throw out there because I think it's we very often see people just blindly say, "Well, the research supports the full range of motion is better," um, and I just I think that's false. When you look at a lot of the stuff, I think the best conclusion is is that it's very important from a hypertrophy perspective that you use the range of motion that challenges the muscle you're trying to hypertrophy the most. That's the, that's the one pattern I see going through all of the research is that seems to be the factor. Um, I don't know if you've seen similar things with that, Jacob, or want to uh, add to that before we move on to passive versus active. Yeah. I mean, I was going to add, and, and like, like you said, like, obviously if we look at strength curves of muscles, like, when your actin is the most connected to each other through like the contraction of the muscle and when they're the most farther apart, if we take that portion out of the lift, um, it would make sense that, okay, now I'm able to lift more absolute loads or to stimulate the muscle in more of a way um, because of just how the physiology of the muscle is. Um, so you're able to more effectively target, say, like your quadricep in a squat. Um, and, um, I think some of it comes from even where we get into like this, we'll get into the discussion of like passive and stuff where some people feel too, that they might get injured by working through their full ranges and, and stuff like that. All right. So passive versus active, like the way I, I look at passive, um, it versus active, the simple definition is, is that passive is basically means you have to be taken to this position in the absence of your own muscular contraction, which is often going to be greater than your active range of motion. Cause as soon as you start actually contracting muscles around a joint, right now we're creating, you know, tension, co-contractions or whatever. Uh, and so we're, mm-hmm. we're limiting range of motion, which definitely isn't a bad thing. Cause if we functioned at bone on bone and landmarks throughout our, you know, day-to-day activities, we'd probably do a lot of damage to our tissues. Um, if, you know, we weren't slightly being limited by the, the soft tissues. Um, and so for, 
to add a little bit more context to active range, what I would say is a good way to look at it is, is that if we think of the agonist muscle, so it's, you know, it's your sternal division of your pec or whatnot, right? Your active range would be as far as you could pull your arm across with no load, just contracting that muscle. Um, but then the other end of the active range would actually be you contracting your antagonist to stretch that. So it's still under your own muscle contraction. You know, the end of that range is just, it's how far your body will let you take it uh, the other direction. So essentially your nervous system is governing the two endpoints up there right. by the relationship between those agonist uh, antagonists. And that's kind of what we defined as the end of active range of motion and passive range of motion like this is not really um, something that I think people like if you look at it in the therapy setting, like if we were table testing somebody and we're like testing their passive range of motion, like I don't look at that as the same as when somebody's mm. doing a, a loaded exercise and it pushes them past their active range, active range of motion, right? Like I would look at yeah. that as almost like I would call it like a forced range of motion because basically you're using, you're needing mm. additional force to push you beyond that active, but it's still, but it's a loaded force. So I think contextually it's important that people kind of take those two things like a little bit differently, especially when we start talking about the implications of safety and whatnot. Um, yeah. So I'll pass it off to you. Well, yeah. Cause like you said, like, that's where you get more even to like specific to like if you're going through a strength block and you specifically wanted to increase your um say like an off season for a bodybuilder if they're going to do a powerlifting competition they need to and i know we'll get into like your definitions of like sport specific um range of motion too they may have times where because of your strength and the normal like motions you use you can't achieve a certain range without like a load on you or a certain amount of load um <clears throat> like a lot of heavy squatters in the powerlifting realm uh have difficulty achieving full squat depth to competition standards if they don't have a sufficient load on the bar for example and that's because you're just tuned to specifically do this very sport specific task very well um you know like guys like bryce lewis and and things like that. We've had conversations where, you know, he's like, Hey, I could put a bar on my back and I can't get into a full uh, depth because it's just not enough load to push me through that. Um, and, you know, like you say, like the passive ranges, it's, it's can be divided even into stretching and, and things like that. And as we discussed, like passive range of motion doesn't necessarily increase the length of your tissue too. It's more of a, a concept where, achieving these passive ranges and even certain sports will do it. And you could potentially do it in bodybuilding too, to help with injury prevention or re reduction of the risk of it is it makes you potentially more resilient in certain positions that you may, you know, accidentally go through in like training errors or things like that, where we see uh, Olympic weightlifters train knee valgus specifically. Um, you know, there's other uh, contexts like that where, um, these passive ranges, we don't achieve them as often, and it's more of about making to get more of it. You really have to get the nervous system used to a specific uh, like threshold of pain or discomfort in that position rather than lengthening, lengthening tissue. One of the things you know that that I think we've found valuable because I saw the same pattern in like powerlifting. You know, or you'd, you'd have the, a lot of these athletes mm -hmm. that could not get down. Um, but if we could actually get them to contract the antagonist tissue, they would actually get more range. But in mm -hmm. the action, but in the in the action of performing eccentric, their body is kind of rewired is is building up that force. But we could eliminate that yeah. kind of neurological response by contracting the antagonist, mm -hmm. and that could often be a way to open up that range very easy it, that that usually ended up having to be the thing mm. is it's like okay like oh you know i can't quite get down all the way but it'd be like okay if we took them to another exercise where we actually lengthened the those tissues by putting them in an exercise that shortened their antagonist tissues all of a sudden now they could start to get that get that depth and that's kind of a one of the strategies that we've been used to kind of help those people maintain like good motion and mobility and proprioception um, and and without losing the qualities of strength. So, because then as soon as you put the load back on them, they retain, they return to that rigidity. 
but it's like, okay, if we decrease, if, if we get your body to say, okay, if we're eliminating that, we're activating the antagonist tissue, you still have all this range available, but if mm. you give us that load, we're going to respond to it. Um, I don't know if you've seen similar responses, but we've been able mm. to take those people that were otherwise very, very stiff, start to incorporate this stuff. And now their motion opens up a lot more. So now their, their 135 pound squat can hit the same depth as their 405 pound squat. Um, which I think from a being able to warm up properly and train or whatever, like I think it serves a lot of utility. Yeah, I could definitely see that too, where, you know, there's obviously different ways you can achieve that as well. Like we go through, we have <clears throat> in strength guys, a standardized like way that we assess our um, athletes for their, uh, technique and different things like that and like warming up as part of the process your warm-ups are you know part of the practice of a of a skill of a lift and especially for bodybuilders if that's going to be something that's like long term in your programming and your track using that as one of your main guiding points for like tracking your progress um you know as like if you want to call it a core lift or a different type of pattern that you're going to do a lot of then that's that's worth practicing that skill in in that context so that you're more familiar with it you're better at it um and you can you know because more awareness in that lift is only going to help you to build more muscle like there is stuff to this like mind muscle connection where if you're more in tune with your body in that position you'll have better motor patterning and be able to activate these muscles in a much more fine-tuned way to where you can get more out of certain lifts um going into the future and you know, practicing certain patterns, your joints will get used to those positions um, and build resiliency through the ranges that you're going to be using a lot and theoretically, you know, help the cartilage and ligaments and things like that to reduce your risk of injury in the future too. Cool. So I think you guys have done a really good job of explaining kind of full range of motion and how that's kind of actually specific to the goal at hand. And then the general kind of mm. definitions of active and passive in terms of like active range of motion, that's what your kind of body can produce without any assistance, uh, kind of no bar on the back and everything like that. And your active range sounds like it could change if you warm up more effectively uh, via different methods, which is really cool. And obviously passive is if you're kind of forced more so into a position through load or obviously within kind of physiotherapy if someone's putting a stretch on you. Uh, I'm interested to hear kind of if there's any disagreements in terms of i know i've spoken to jacob about it a little bit in terms of like uh, the stretch under load and kind of doing that through a passive range of motion and potentially there being some hypertrophic benefits as we kind of stretch under load is like a independent kind of driver of hypertrophy potentially and whether or not if you're training through active and you're not getting these stretched positions as much or and kind of is that safe is that risk-free or are there problems kind of going through that so i don't know if jacob you want to I don't know if I kind of uh, said correctly how you feel about that or um, what your kind of ideas are. I don't know if you want to kind of clarify and then Kasim can come in with some thoughts. Yeah, because I know our discussion centered around like, you know, I am also of the mindset that not always more range of motion is better depending on what your goal is specifically. But definitely the idea of like going through, say, like articular positions. Um, there's not as much evidence as we used to think about how much that was going to affect the joint integrity and the strength of the joint, because there's a lot more uh, newer research that's come out in the last few years showing like certain beneficial uh, adaptations inside joints uh, when you are um, kind of training into these positions that maybe you normally wouldn't get into. Like there's been a few um, that have come out showing like regeneration of cartilage in certain joints. Um, through specific movements, um, specific, like, um, these are the examples I have because most of the research is going to be done in sports or like to get it funded, you have to have some kind of like target, um, you know, different sport athletes where they're going through these specific training principles and seeing that, well, okay, your, you know, disc in your back regenerated, uh, a significant amount or, you know, herniations reabsorbed or, um, you know, ACLs, can become thicker in um, specific lifting. So these these positions of like, you know, one of the things I learned in school was like not to do a knee extension at a certain load because it would tear your ACL because of shearing forces. 
but like we know that's not true because as you adapt and get adjusted to some of these activities, you know, your inherent risk of acquiring injury could potentially reduce. And if you're going to be, you know, doing specific tasks that put you in a strain in that position, it'd, it'd be better if you practiced that a little bit in, um, you know, a controlled manner to reduce your risk of in- occurring some of these types of injuries that people are commonly afraid of having. Hey, Pascal here. I just wanted to take the moment to talk about our membership site. Inside, you'll find a thriving forum, an extensive exercise library, courses, presentations, and research reviews. All I need you to do is hit the link in the description below and sign up. See you there. How do you feel, Kasim? Is that kind of, would you go along with that or do you have some different perspectives? Yeah, um, when it comes to, uh, I'll try and address all the points and then if I I forget some of the ones you originally mentioned, um, let me know. So when it comes to like training for hypertrophy, like how valid or useful would going into some of those passive ranges being um, to address the actual stimulus thing, which uh, is mostly through the AKT uh, pathway, right? Is kind of what they've measured. They've also disclosed that you do get a higher activation of that still working through like the rate, like a contract or regular concentric range of motion than you do in the loaded stretch. So it's like mm-hmm. you get a stimulus there, but it is less stimulus than you get during the the normal training. So I think that's important caveat yeah. there is just like, okay, yeah, the, we loaded, like if we're getting into there and we're loading that stretch position, it contributes to the stimulus, but not to a greater magnitude than the other thing. Where I'm actually curious with that, with the research going forward is whether or not we start to see that maybe there's some better adaptations that are more um, like kind of into the passive or structural tissues. Like, do we get more Titan based adaptations in some of these stretch positions? That's kind of my theory of why we still do some lengthened exercises for hypertrophy um, is, is for that mechanical, you know, kind of like that mechanical stress on the actual passive structures. Cause if we're all we're doing is focusing on beefing up actin and myosin, but we're not actually all of the other structures that transfer the force of the muscle, like, those things need to be built up, you know, proportionately as we're going to increase intensity. So maybe, you know, these things may not get as much of an uptick in mTOR or some of these, you know, fancy pathways that we like to talk about in the pertry world, but they're really important for maintaining the structural integrity of that tissue that we're going in, you know, and pumping up, uh, you know, five times a week or, or whatever. So I think it's important to look at the stimulus there and be like, okay, it exists. The research we have right now says like, in terms of an all out hypertrophy thing, it's probably a poor place if we're just looking at, you know, myofibular based hypertrophy, but there may be some potential structural benefits there that we just aren't aware of yet. And that's kind of where my, my theory goes. Now, the question is how much of a loaded stretch do we need to get to? And this is where kind of like what your definition of passive and what those, um, what the situation is, I think, common sense is a really good guide here because most of the people that i think do get in trouble with using you know you know passive range of motion is it's they go like too deep or it's inappropriate loading so if you just remove the jackassery Mm -hmm. you're probably going to remove a huge chunk of your injury risk with a lot of these things and then the other thing would be specificity of that range of motion so for instance if i'm taking a motion deeper into a range. So if I'm doing a a chest press, right, and I'm letting it kind of push me past my active range of motion, I'm getting a little bit more of a deep stretch, but it's still actually in the plane of that muscles, the biomechanics of the joints are still kind of functioning well. That's completely different than if all of a sudden I'm getting like this anterior tilting, my shoulders are coming forward and I'm basically taking the load and putting it on a bunch of other less mechanically efficient tissues. That's where I'm like, okay, now that's a bad passive situation. Like, so once, if we're pushing to the point where like the mechanics change and the, like the tensile, like the contractile tissue demand changes so much, that's where I think people, one, can get injured or two, they start developing bad motor patterns where all of a sudden now as they're going to the eccentric, they start learning to guide themselves towards this other passively, like, like tissue balls, tension to rebound from. Um, and I think one of the things that we do that we can actually pull from the, the research on injuries is that, you know, 
I think in the past, everybody focused on tissue tolerance, right? Like you'd get an injury. And so the response to that would be like, okay, that thing that broke, we're just going to beef that up. When in reality, when we look at the patterns that we see um, in injuries that occur, it happens more when we use tissue inappropriately, because if we use tissue inappropriately, the magnitude of force that we would need to put through it can go up way, way, way beyond its, you know, its tissue tolerance. So it's like, well, okay, like if, if I, you know, strain something and I make it 20% better, but when I go out of this technique, it asks for 400% more, it's kind of a fruitless process versus just like, okay, why don't I just make sure I maintain the technique and the mechanics so that I don't ever put my body in a position where it has to use something in a way that like, I'm not really structurally intended to use it. Cause that's what usually causes the, the, you know, the, the stress to go way beyond the tissue tolerance is when we actually use something inappropriately. And that's what I see happening when we kind of go into a passive range where it's not just like I'm putting a little bit more stretch on, you know, the actual like passive tissues of that direct tissue, but I'm actually starting to pass the load off to structures outside of the desired muscle that I'm trying to work on. So I guess my line in the sand would be is that you have to do it with appropriate loading. You have to, like, if you're going to go start going into these ranges, there should be a graduation process. Um, and that process shouldn't exceed the biomechanics uh, or the, like the, like the line of pull of the intended tissue that you're trying to work. If that makes sense. Yeah. I, I actually really like that definition. Cause I think, I mean, it just, it makes a lot of inherent sense, I think as well. And I like the idea of graduating just because, just as a standalone example for myself, at least I know my range of motion has improved over time. Uh, it's probably like down to lots of different various factors. I'm probably just able to control that better, but um, I've certainly found that. And you can do that, like you said, in a safe way. And you can also do it in an unsafe way. Like if people just hear, oh, more range of motion is better. And they just start like really dive bombing a squat, for example. And like, oh, it's just so many things will change. Or like bench pressing is another good example where the mechanics of the lift just you start taking things onto shoulders and putting injuries at think or things at risk there. So I, yeah, I really like that definition, that kind of discussion between you two. I don't know if Jacob had any other additional points. Um, I mean, I think we use kind of a similar um, concept and idea, just more uh, specific because of our clients, like towards powerlifting. Like we have uh, the standards and we try to, you know, achieve those standards at a very high level, very consistently. But um, I've almost been like working with our team in, in discussions of like, okay, but when an athlete does, you know, change those parameters for whatever reason, maybe they're more fatigued or whatever, like, you know, sometimes these aren't necessarily bad as in like how variation can help with motor learning, um, can help with integrity of the joint because of say specific to our sport of powerlifting, there's going to be times where you're at a meet or something like that, where quite honestly, like most of our high, high level athletes, I don't see many leaks in their, um, technique, but there are going to be some times where maybe it's less than ideal and we want our athletes to be prepared for those scenarios as well to either be able to get out of that position uh, without incurring an injury or to um, still, you know, without incurring an injury, that's going to be our first step is um, to complete the lift uh, you know, learning to some athletes are just get really good at grinding through lifts um, for example. But um, you know, we want that framework to start with. And then if, you know, just because the inherent concern of like say joint injuries is is just different now than what we used to all previously think it was and i think that's where some of the differences are and i'm just being like uh facetious for the sake of the argument of how like uh pain and cartilage and adaptation can occur inside the joints differently I don't know if you have any, you know, yeah, they go <laughs> with power. I always what I always just think it's so funny that when we're ever talking about these, uh, like some of these biomechanics or safety, like we always tend to go to these directions of talking about powerlifting. And I don't know why anybody in the community thinks that like the most optimal or safe way to do things for your joint has anything to do with the way that powerlifters do it. Cause it's such what it's such a specific sport with mm -hmm. such a specific expression or whatever. And if it's like, if your goal is hypertrophy, the strategies that somebody needs to use to do a maximum one arm mm -hmm. rep and possibly 
they have a structure that just is going to require them to do things that just are not the most optimal for their joints or whatever. It's like, okay, they have to essentially build an armored car to drive down that road. And it's like, yep. if you do that, all you're going to do is get really crappy gas mileage in terms of you just like, you're just going to be doing a lot of stuff that you don't need to be doing or whatnot. And so it's like, I think it's very important that you look at the context of what is the outcome that you're going for. Um, and then also like, what things do you need to be resilient to and, and prepared for, right? Because if you're doing a sport, you, you can't control the requirements of those sports. So it's one thing when it's like, okay, based off of the body that I have, I have to make it fit. I have to, I have to make it fit this thing in the safest way possible. But when the goal is hypertrophy, it's like, I don't have to do any of those things. I can just choose the thing that actually I can do the safest and just focus on stimulating the tissue that I want to. And like all of those other things, it's like, okay, like, you know, unless I'm not training in any, you know, I don't have any variety of my training and not training in a full range of motion. I'm not going to become super injury prone from doing hypertrophy, doing like day-to-day -day activities, or if, you know, mm. decide to pick up softball or, or whatever. But when your sport is, it's, I have to do this specific activity. I have to fit it. And I'm going to do, thousands and thousands and thousands of repetitions that are biased to that. And my ability to attribute volume to things that would balance that out is minimized because I have to push this goal of specificity so far. That's where it's like, okay, now, now we start bending the rules a, a little bit from like what would be optimal from just like, yeah, okay, mm. this, this would be better versus like, you know what, in this case, this is the new optimal because I have like, I'm going to be under these stresses that if I didn't have to, I wouldn't voluntarily put myself under. And I guess that's yeah. the, I, I mean, oh, I go think... for it, Jacob. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say like, cause uh, you know, obviously and and that's going to change in my mind too, depending on like where somebody is at in their training. Um, like say prep for show, I'm going to be much more conservative with exercises that I would recommend and program because of these other extraneous factors that could then lead to injury versus if somebody say we're in their off season, um, we maybe want to work on specific like strength uh, expressions just because of how that may be able to influence your um, capacity for hypertrophy and total amounts of volume. And, and, and other things are, are in a more ideal state already to inherently reduce your risk of incurring some kind of injury or developing pain. Um, so those are the scenarios and just making sure that, I mean, not that this would happen that you'd have to be like a robot and, and just be like, I, I only body build, um, um, to not do certain things in the, in a daily life that would already, you know, you'd be exposed to like moving and things like that. Um, the other issue would be, is that with certain tendons, we do run the risk of, um, not using them in certain ranges. They, uh, see loads differently and we want to make sure that those also adapt well with the myofibular portions of the muscle you know because it's a non-contractile tissue um that the attachment to the bone there's been a lot more research into that lately and how the collagen changes and and we do see that if <clears throat> people start to develop tendon issues um like say elbow tendonitis shoulder um that we do actually want to use more range of motion in particular circumstances to um, allow the expression of force through the tendon um, to to help with collagen development, but that's also a nuanced discussion in in rehab that there's differing opinions on. Yeah, I mean, when we're talking about strength and function, I definitely think mm -hmm. that you know more range of motion is. Good. I wouldn't shouldn't say more, but like we'll quote unquote say full range of motion for that specific tissue is definitely the 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 way to go but then when we come to like specific exercises and stuff like that that's where i'm like well mm. not all of that may be necessary or beneficial or may you know to use the the sfr principle like you may be getting a lower stimulus to fatigue ratio because a part of this motion mm. is just kind of a a waste of time where it's loading another tissue you're just expending neurological and metabolic energy that you could be saving to direct uh, into the target tissue, right? Um, you know, I mean, some mm -hmm. exercises are almost like a rest pause for one muscle versus, you know, another thing, depending on the technique. Um, now, a question I have yeah. for you is that when you say expressions mm -hmm. of strength, because um, when some people say that, they think like, well, okay, if I'm focusing on that, 
then it's like, okay, that means we're doing squat and bench and deadlift and, you know, cleans or whatever. Whereas mm-hmm. my point of view from a physique athlete, when we, we'll do what we call like a neurological phase or whatever, which is basically focused on strength-based qualities, but it doesn't require mm-hmm. them to do those lifts, right? Like I'm perfectly fine yeah. with like, okay, cool. For you, a hack squat is a better place for you to express knee extension strength for your, like, or whatever. Like we don't have to fit you to a squat to focus on that goal. Um, you know, and so we just have to, we have to build a program that still accomplishes what we need to, but we can choose exercises that, you know, that fit you better. Right. So maybe you're a trap bar deadlifter versus a, you know, a, a off the floor barbell deadlift or whatever it may be, but it's like, okay, this is actually the place where you can express strength specifically to that part of the chain or, or those muscles and still go through a large range of motion. And for many cases, you know, for some people, they may actually get more specific range of motion that way than they would in like, okay, well, this is the fullest squat that you can get, right? It might be like, well, if we kind of broke that up into two other things, we could actually express more range of motion in those individual joints and load them throughout a greater percentage of that range of motion. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Obviously um, I look at movements as their patterns, like in, in what is our goal at the end of the day? You know, not everybody needs to be a body or not a bodybuilder. I mean, a power lifter that does squat, bench, and deadlift. Like those are patterns of movements that, if we look at them in a hypertrophy sense, they're going to target specific muscles more than others. Um, I mean, theoretically, you could even break down like biceps if you wanted to into like a, you know, a strength block. Not that I would see maybe that that would be as beneficial as as just training them normally, but um, you know it whatever that movement is for that person that they can best be in tune with their knee extension. For example, if we want to work on their quadriceps, then if it's a hack squat, if it's a leg press, if it is a barbell squat, if it's a step up, if it's a lunge, um, it's just, that's a continuum of uh, a variety of things and what's going to, you know, what's the N of one science gives us a big perspective of what might work from a general sense, but we have to then tune that in to what's this individual's best fit and what's going to be optimal for them in their scenarios. Great. I um I really like this discussion and I just want to I hope maybe some listeners might feel like they're a little bit lost and I just think something that would be really really helpful for them mm. is maybe take uh if you both were to take through like if you had a a client how would you if you're programming them through like a leg press how would you advise them to kind of execute that movement? assuming we're using it for the quads seeing as that's probably what it's built best for if, if jacob you kind of discuss how you would like if you're taking a client through their leg press how kind of would you uh, get them to perform that in terms of range of motion i guess yeah i mean typically like i mean um so say it's a standard like sled leg press um you know i'm gonna have them put their typically i may use more of a uh olympic shoe because of the lever there um have their feet similar stance um this is just typically the one that i prefer similar stance to like kind of like a squat um and then going through their most comfortable range of motion where it doesn't i mean i typically tend to use more of a range of motion um as long as their like back isn't rounding off of the back pad they can feel a contraction in their quadriceps and then they're able to get like you know drive through the sled and extend their knees um you know, to get into almost a full straight in position and then relax off of that and go back into that, you know, um, deeper position as long as they're not coming off of the, that back pad and, and things like that. I almost treat it in that respect. It's, I know it's not very like specific. I'm sure his, his answer will be much more nuanced. And only quickly, Jacob, is it safe to lock out your knees at the top of the top of the leg press just because this is a topic that comes up people see it all the time it's like for the most part it's fine like it's not going to immediately like lead to your leg breaking in half but i have seen instances where people were lifting weights or they had weights on there that they shouldn't have and then they lock out and then it leads to them hyperextending and seen some pretty gruesome videos so it's safe if you're using it generally safe if you're using an appropriate load is that what you'd say yeah 
and you're, you're not going to where your like leg is then bending backwards like that and you can't control that position anymore my legs can't even do that i don't know what weirdos can do that <laughs> no, some people can i know Kasim, sorry um how would you go about and maybe yeah touch on how you would do it maybe any differences um towards jacob yeah, so, I mean, similarities in terms of, uh, you know, the limiting factors are going to be dorsiflexion, hip, hip flexion, right? So if either of those two, you know, runs to an end point before you get the range of motion at your knee, that's going to be your, your limiting factor, right? So if you, you know, need a, a weightlifting shoe or some sort of heel lift or whatnot, um, a lot of people, if they have a leg press where it's just a flat plate, that ends up being the challenge is usually that ankle mobility, you know, thing. So if you have a leg press where it like kind of bends in the middle or something like that, where it reduces the amount of dorsiflexion that you need, um, and it's usually on that bottom plate, so then you can put your feet lower, which is going to allow you to, you know, go further down and get more knee flexion. And so the goal would be if we're doing this for quads is that I'm trying to basically get my, you know, my calf to touch my hamstring. Right. And that needs to happen before I run a mobility at the ankle or the hip. So at the ankle, we got a couple things that we can work on. One is just setting the foot like slightly out just to allow that pronation that also needs to occur to get a little bit more uh, dorsiflexion if I don't have another means of eliminating that. Um, and then the, with the hip, um, basically this is where the width can come into play for some people how much hip flexion they can get they may get a lot more by having a little bit more of an abducted or, or like duck foot you know open toed uh, position based off of the structure of their hip so essentially what i'm going to try and do is go just wide enough or open enough with their stance that the hip flexion is not the limiting factor and do whatever I can at the foot to make that not a limiting factor. And then my range of motion is hopefully going to be calf to, to hamstring uh, at, at that point in time. So really, you know, it comes down to that end of one thing of just making sure that the actual limiting variable is the joint and the muscle that you are actually trying to train. And so it's, I'm manipulating all the variables around that. Um, and that, that would, that would extend to any exercise, a hack squat or, or whatnot. Um, so that's how I would do it. Sounds or actually the thought process anyway. Very similar. Yeah. But I just he said if I would be more nuanced, and I didn't want to disappoint. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's great because I, I, at least when I, I I I don't know I have a not a huge amount of experience looking at people doing it, but I think I'd seen people trying to use active range of motion and they'd sit in the carriage and then they'd have their legs up, but then just look to pull back their knee as close as they could to themselves and they're like oh as far as i can bring that that's as far as i can that's my active range i shouldn't come any deeper but i i haven't done that often but i think i've if i was to do that i think i'd probably get less range than when i then use the carriage and that i i don't know if that's the correct difference between passive and active in that sense is how do you feel about that Kasim? Hi guys, Steve here. Just wanted to take a moment of your time to remind you of our online coaching service. At Revive Stronger, we pride ourselves on providing personalized service that will take your physique and knowledge to the next level. If you're interested, check the description and sign up. Yeah, so that, that is what we would kind of define as active. And so that's where we would then individualize the hip position. Cause say somebody pulled their leg up and they couldn't get it far back rather than just saying, well, okay, that's all we got. And then we're just gonna limit the range of motion with that. What we would do then is like, okay, well let's work on AB ducking the hip or whatever and actually see is, is there a position where we can actually get that hip to come up more. And that's usually, that's usually what happens, right? Is, you know, cause if you just arbitrarily just like pull back depending on what you pulled back, whether it's you use a little bit more psoas or a little bit more rec fem or whatever happened to been, the arc at which you pull that hip, you're gonna run into a certain endpoint. And that may not be enough flexion for what you need uh, in this exercise, right? And then this is also an area where say, you know, somebody because of the way they've trained in that instance where it's like when they're just pulling back, they may actually, you know, do, you know, it's like, okay, they don't have much range. That may be actually an area where it's like, okay, if I actually gave them an exercise of hip flexion, right? And then had them go back in the leg press, their active range may open up. And that would just tell me like, okay, cool. Right. That just means that like, we just kind of, you know, we prepped your nervous system better to be able to have more control and be more prepared to, to do this movement. Um, and that, you know, it's not a structural limitation. It was a neurological limitation from there. And so, you know, I still like, we do use a lot of those kind of like active range checks, especially, you know, 
especially for beginner clients and stuff like that. Because again, if we're looking at a graduation process, it would be like, okay, well, maybe we start here and then we try and progressively push that. Um, and one thing you may see if your exercise is set up well, is that you, it improves over reps and over sets, right? If you just happen to be that person that like, okay, you came in and your nervous system was in kind of like that, you know, state of like, okay, we're going to be a little bit more rigid. All of a sudden we start going through some of these range of, you know, so this range of motion and then our body says, okay, you can have 10% more. And then we go through that. And then it says, you can have 10% more. And that's, that's what you often see when people are doing, we'll say a proper, a proper technique and an exercise. Right. But I think when people are doing a really crappy technique or that we're, you know, they're not set up properly or whatnot, they don't get those benefits. Sometimes it's like almost like you'll see some people like, Oh, they'll start doing something and then they get something feels tight or twingy or weird. That's usually, it's like, well, they're not getting that, but it's because the technique is poor and their body's adapting or responding to like that crappy stress that's being put on it. Cool. No, I, I think um, that was really well described because I think, where I guess the problems might settle in for a lot of people because it sounds like a lot of your guys' thoughts settle to be very similar in that what's safe and what's not and active and passive um, can be quite kind of disparate but in some instances they can be quite a similar range in some ways and it's a case of how far is your active from your passive and don't just jump from like if you've got a short active range at the moment don't jump to like a complete deep passive that you have no control over that's kind of probably going to cause risk of injury and it's over time you can kind of potentially extend that range through proper control and execution better warming up better my muscle connection and as you potentially stretch some of those passive structures it might, might open some things up i don't know if that's a, a fair description of kind of where you guys kind of line up in your thoughts i'd say that's fair yeah and I, I was just going to throw in a, a example too. I was just thinking of in the clinic. Um, you'll often, I'll often see this with clients that they come in and um, if they have a huge disparity between like their active and their passive motion, it, and it's usually because they have pain and because your your nervous system is reflexively saying like, "Hey, don't do this. Something's going on here. Like, I don't like this. I don't want you to." you know, move into this position because I think it's going to cause you more harm than it is good. So those are things where we can look at potentially if it's hindering their sport performance for hypertrophy, like why is that the case? Do you have pain? Is there something else that we need to address to allow you to, you know, they shouldn't be equal to each other, but if they're like 20 degrees different, you know, that's a concern or is there, you know, muscular patterning that's happening that's preventing you from achieving the technique that we want. Um, I'll see that, that with some people after like shoulder surgeries, they, they can passively get here, but as soon as you have them try and raise their arm up, they're doing like this, raising, you know, bending their body to the side. And obviously we don't want to see people doing that when they're doing lateral raises, um, to work on their delts. Absolutely. Um, I don't know if uh, one kind of final topic to potentially talk about, as I know, Kasim, in your article, you talked about isolated muscle range of motion and that's quite specific towards physique competitors and uh, i don't know if obviously both of you coach guys who are trying to build muscle i don't know if you have differences in how you might program exercises um it sounds like uh, actually Kasim, uh, define kind of what this isolated muscle range of motion is it probably says what it is on the tin a little bit um and but how you might apply that and if jacob has any kind of differences in thoughts of opinion yeah. So with isolated range of motion, what it is going to be is it's it's going to be specific to obviously that isolated muscle um, in its range, but also in in the actual path of motion. Like there's a specificity of like this motion now has to be this specific motion. So if I'm doing a chest you know exercise, there might be multiple ways that I can you know extend and you know a a b duct my arms as I'm going down. Um, but there will be a different arc for the sternal division of the pec versus the costal versus the clavicular division of the pec, right? So the range of motion is essentially, you know, how can I get this muscle origin closest to insertion, right, from the opposite, furthest away from, and then what does that arc of motion look like? So essentially, what we're looking for that is like, okay, if I follow this arc, that means that the mechanical loading, you know, is provided I have a good resistance, is is all being done by this tissue that I'm targeting, right? And so it is going to be the thing that like creates the stop at that end range. Because if I'm if I'm focusing on trying to build up one thing, 
like if I'm, I'm really trying to focus on bringing up my upper chest or something like that. Okay. But I just do a bunch of chest exercises or I do chest exercises that are labeled lower chest, but I let my elbows move or something in a technique that allows that, that load to kind of just shift to other things. I'm not really one, I'm not getting, you know, I'm not getting a very isolated stimulus, which means like it's not, I'm going to accumulate a lot more fatigue and work, you know, to get the same amount. Um, but it also means that I have the capacity like then to like just move into a position that makes another tissue the primary tissue, right? So it's like, okay, that might be the thing that actually limits the set at that point in time if I deviate that. So it's like, well, I could do a lot of chest exercises, um, and but what happens to be getting the most stimulus? What is determining, you know, what I'm, when I'm actually reaching failure in that exercise, that's very specific when I'm using an isolated muscle range of motion because it's like, okay, this is the thing that's doing the work the whole time. I'm working in its end-to-end -end ranges of motion. And so now I'm able to be very, very specific with the training stimulus, the, the training effect, right? And I think, you know, we the way that we program, this is something that allows us to like, to really kind of choose exercises, you know, well, so it's like, okay, if you're doing biceps and you're doing, you know, you're training them three times a week or whatever, say just arbitrarily, let's say you're using four exercises over the course of the week, right? Like, well, how do you choose those, those four movements? Right. And it's like, well, okay, if I understand the specific range of motion for the biceps and then I can be like, okay, well, this is going to challenge it in a little bit more short and length. And this is going to be a little bit more length and, or this is going to be a little bit more long head. This is going to be a little bit more short head of bicep. And then I can actually make intuitive exercise selections depending on what I want to accomplish. Do I want to distribute that those four exercises across the elbow flexors or do I have certain ones that I want to focus on more? And so I can choose exercises that are going to challenge that tissue. And I can make sure that I cover that tissue's entire range of motion because for something like a two joint muscle like a biceps it covers a lot of range of motion right and to this day the only exercise i know that you can like really kind of cover that whole thing would be like throwing a bowling ball like behind your head um you know which i don't know maybe maybe one day that'll become a, a, a sport but uh yeah so it's like for those you're gonna need at least two exercises you know to cover that muscle's entire contractile range right but whether or not that muscle is actually the thing that does the most work depends on if you're actually specific of the motion within that range uh, Jacob, any, uh, I, I like that definition. It seems to make a lot of sense. Um, Jacob, anything different towards that? How do you feel? I mean, in general, that makes the most sense because, I mean, we can only gleam so much from EMG studies. I don't think there's a lot of, like, from what I've seen, carryover from them. So it makes more sense physiologically for a person to start at those kind of points and then make adjustments based on the person, like, what their mind-muscle connection is. Um and if you have two, you know, muscles that cover multiple joints, you, you may have to target them uh, to achieve ideal hypertrophy or say if somebody has a weak point in particular, you're going to have to target them a little bit differently um, in the movements that you want to program for them because, um, you know, like, I don't know, just because you said biceps, I'm just going to use this for example. And I, and I liked a lot, everything you said, um, but we were always trained to like, you know, in, in anatomy, like biceps are actually a primary supinator too so it's like okay we need to include something uh, obviously that's going to work that but you know just doing elbow flexion may not train your bicep in the way that we want to achieve you know the look of it to look at the end point on stage so you need to have a variety and and look at okay what optimally brings those origins and insertions together so i'm training you know multiple qualities and multiple portions of this muscle because they also have different you know muscle bellies and we want those to look a certain way when we step on stage so this is a good example where um we can talk a, a, a bit of nuance into that isolated mm -hmm. muscle motions right so that yeah like so the biceps have a supination function or yeah one of the things we're currently actually we're researching right now is is there function supination or is it more anti pronation? But I won't okay. jump down that rabbit hole. Uh, but just you know, let sleep on that tonight and think about that. Yeah, that's interesting uh, though. Right. Um, but so it's like okay, so the biceps are supinators, but they're not full supinators. Meaning that if you mm -hmm. actually over supinate, you supinate past like your supinator, right? Which yep. guess what? The supinator is a more stronger supinator than the biceps are, right? Yep. Well, well named muscle, the supinator. Um, 
you know, I don't know why the biceps aren't called like the elbow flexor, but <laughs> like the, the hand upper. Um, but anyway, um, so you can over supinate and then actually get less biceps because you mm. emphasize that portion of the motion outside of the arc of the bicep, right? And yeah. consequently, you can also over pronate at the bottom and actually get yourself into a position where it's like, okay, this is not really a length and bicep position anymore. This is now the length and pronator position, or it's more of a mm. brachial radialis or brachialis position, whatever it may be. So it's like, okay, so it's like you take a muscle and it's like you look at it in the, your anatomy book or whatnot or your app now. Yep. Um, and it's like, well, it's got these list of functions. And one of the biggest mistakes that people make in their attempt to do these exercises is they just do the list of functions, right? So it's like, okay, a bicep does these things. So what I'm going to do during this exercise is I'm going to do all of those three things. Yeah. And it's important to understand when we're talking about isolated muscle uh, range, it's like that you have to know what degree and how that happens throughout that whole global arc. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, how do I actually need to be going through this supination process as I'm doing the elbow flexion to make that happen? Right. Or am I actually better off training elbow flexion with a variety of degrees of supination or maybe just a resistance mm -hmm. like an offset dumbbell, right? Where you put your thumb against the plate. So there's a little bit more dumbbell hanging off the other side, but you just do a supinated curl, but there's just a little bit more load biased in towards of like pulling you into pronation. So you have to do that supination a little bit more like, so there's all these different strategies that you could do that would maybe fit a little bit more, but if you over exaggerate, one function or you over exaggerate a different part you could be doing something that in the book says this is that muscle's function but you actually just take yourself right out of the path or the range of that actual muscle yeah yeah and obviously i mean and for me the way that i would program these are nuances that i'm probably getting into that are um not my starting points because of uh the list of importance of other things that going to go into hypertrophy like this is when we get down to okay i got your general program set up now let's really individualize this to that person and make sure that they're doing things that we are going to optimize because if if i can't even get the person to go in and train the number of days a week that i want then it won't matter how they do their bicep curl yeah we, we can always look at like well how much how much does this this stuff matter and and the logistics of the coaching or whatnot and i think Part of that comes down to just developing a good system and having good, you know, good resources, right? If you have yes. really good, you know, cues and videos and or an exercise library to resource mm -hmm. to, so that, like, that's not something you as a coach have to like. So if I program a bicep curl, I can say like, for instance, with our like the way I built my library is it's like uh -huh. it's by muscle primary and it actually tells you like what length you're working that tissue in and stuff. So it's like, okay, I can then just like choose this, send that, and I have to rewrite that. So if, I mean, if you're a coach, yep. um, that's those, those tools, they pay off. Like <laughs> as you start writing these programs, they, they, they pay themselves off really, really, really well. Um, you know, cause like, for example, I'm sure you guys have seen this like uh, a million times in the gym. Like how many times you see somebody doing a supinating curl and they do like all the supination at el full elbow extension, right? So they basically, yep. they supinate under no resistance and the momentum, the dumbbell just takes them all the way past it. And then they do this curl, like weird thing. that's like going outside their shoulder motion or, or whatever. Right. Um, and there may be a lot of sensation in there almost because as they're curling, their bicep is almost actually wanting them to pronate a little bit so that it can have a better line of pull. So it's like, man, you can eliminate at least the most grievance things by just having like good tools, good demonstration videos or, or whatnot to be able to, to, to follow. Right. Like yeah. common sense goes along goes a long ways with uh, eliminating the majority of these mistakes. Yes. Yeah. And then obviously like these two, if you're a competitor, like these nuanced differences make a big difference over time. Mm -hmm. um, especially if you're going to be somebody that's going to be competing for a long career. Like we look at people that are, you know, have been um, one of the ones that I look at cause I um, like, you know, Jeff Alberts, like he's done things very specifically for a very long period of time. And, and you can see, drastic differences in the way that his physique looks even like from you know between off seasons and stuff because he uses these specific nuances that we're kind of talking about to achieve that you know it's 
when you're on a stage and, and you're potentially going for like, you know, a, if it's a juniors champion or like whatever, like the local championship or you're, you're in that, you know, where it's like the world championship, these percentages add up enough that it's a big, big difference because when you're at, at a higher level, it's, that's the difference between whether or not you take home the gold or you could be not even on the podium. Yeah. And you'd be surprised how, especially with the specificity stuff, if it's, if it's something you've glaringly been missing in your training mm -hmm. for, you know, a long period of time and all of a sudden you introduce it, you can almost make quote unquote, like newbie, newbie gains, right? Like I'll use Steve Kluko as, a, as an example. Mm -hmm. He started doing this lat exercise that we have for the iliac lat, which is, you know, kind of like this prone, like kind of really like pulling on the, on the down, not so much back motion or whatever. Um, if you follow us on social, you've probably seen, it. I think you, you, you posted it maybe like a few weeks back as well, this prone incline thing. And like, this is a guy that's already been on the Olympia stage, right? And all of a sudden from like one show to the next, he's got a different, he's got a new muscle on his body. The guy was already almost 300 pounds of muscles. Like all of a sudden like this. So like if, if you, if you've blatantly been missing like a specific division of thing, you're just like really doing this, that tissue had maybe has never been exposed to that much stimulus because other things are always failing first. And so as soon as you hit it directly, man, it can start catching up really fast. Right. Um, so it's not yeah. like, you know, it's like, man, I'm going to have to do this other exercise for 20 years because I've been training for 20 years for it to get there. And it's like, well, it might catch up in like, you know, a year. I yeah, think for sure, this is where this topic is of full range of motion, which I would say is probably quite a foundational kind of topic in terms of uh, people get it wrong all the time, but with active and passive and that discussion was amazing. And I think is way better understood now for the audience at least because i think there are definite confusions and potentially even camps like active versus like full range or whatever and it's just after you guys have now discussed it i think it's just much clearer that it isn't like a black and white thing it's kind of much closer to kind of what in reality is a safety aspect and a very logical we're training the muscles not motions type of discussion and then this is where it can just get ultimately way more nuanced in terms of how far can we go in isolating muscle groups but for someone who is new to the gym yeah that discussion at the end that you you guys have had isn't super important to them but for like you said someone who's ultimately at the top of their game or wants to be there this is where that sort of nuanced discussion and where you can really target muscles is going to be like imperative to them if they want to take it to that next level because like you mentioned already the stimulus to fatigue ratio like the stimulus you want that muscle to be the limiting factor and if you can't pick an exercise that's appropriately targeting that or you're letting other muscles take over or what have you you're not getting that stimulus and uh, the fatigue is just adding up so yeah guys fantastic chat i don't know if there's anything you want to kind of add <laughs> no i mean i think i think you you pretty much subbed it up and i'll just put an exclamation point on that full range of motion thing of just like full range of motion of what that's so important because i know a, a lot of the people that are like yeah more is better or full range of motion is better they're not qualifying as what and half the time they're actually getting a relatively small amount of range of motion for the muscle that they're targeting, right? They might be doing an exercise and they're, they're swinging their body around or whatever. And it's like, well, okay, you're moving a handle or a dumbbell or a barbell really far, but your actual muscle length is not changing that much. Right? Like, I mean, so that's a, it's, that's a very important tool to have in your toolbox. This is like, okay, I'm training this thing in a full range of, full range of motion if your goal is hypertrophy that thing better be a muscle in most cases yeah and i think it's the difference between you know the, between exercising and training you know for training it has a purpose and that context uh definitely matters uh given what you're trying to train for you know and especially if you want to be very good at this specific sport of hypertrophy like you know, this isn't bodybuilding, but they even talk about in professional athletics, like NFL and NBA, the difference between, you know, somebody who's a Hall of Famer in their sport and the difference between the guy who's either not in the league or gets cut from the team in training camp can be difference of reaction times that are a quarter of a second. So it's like, if you want a long career and you want to be good, like these nuances will matter, you know, at some point in your career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I Absolutely. think... People drastically underestimate how much these nuances will affect the longevity and just the, mm. 
the 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 amount of pleasure versus pain that you will have on this journey. Yeah, even if it's uh, from my perspective, not always even related to injury, but like how much you're fighting against yourself to achieve the best physique that you want to achieve. Absolutely, guys. Thank you so much. I want to make sure um, if people want to kind of reach out to you, learn more. I know, Casim, you already talked about you've got an exercise video library and um, you post all these interesting exercises very regularly. So I want to make sure people can kind of discover those. Where should they head? Casim, first of all, where where should people head? So the best place to see all that stuff is probably uh, on Instagram at at one dot education um, and at n one dot training. Basically, it's a coach and and, and a we'll say like a, I don't want to say regular person, but a, what the education platform is more in depth and the training is is more simple. So you know, choose the flavor that best suits you. Uh, but you can find our full library on uh, on just www n one dot training and try it for a week. Um, I've really that's one of the things that we'll say, we'll put it this way that we're really proud of. And I'll just leave it at that. Awesome. Jacob. Um, I'm best available on Instagram at it, um, at strength and evidence underscore physio. Um, I post mostly like physical therapy related memes. I have some story content and actually I think because of the time that this podcast has come out, um, I've been doing a series on being an adult with ADHD and October is a, a ADHD awareness month. So, Awesome. I didn't even, I was not aware. <laughs> well, you have to go back and watch my series now. Yeah, I will. <laughs> thank you guys so much for coming on. I think this has been a fantastic discussion. Um, and yeah, thank you guys for listening. I'll make sure everything that was spoken there is linked below. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Take care. All right. Thank you, Steve. Thanks. So I'm Steve Hall, founder of Revive Stronger and a coach of Revive Stronger. My name is Pascal Floor. I'm the co-owner of Revive Stronger and also a coach, of course. The Revive Stronger has probably been going solidly for three years, probably roughly about three years. Revive Stronger, to me, it is becoming kind of my child, my foster child. It's the gathering and getting together of like-minded people. We've been expanding the coaching team, which is helping us help more people. Uh, but each coach can only help a certain number of people. Right now, it's all over the place. We have YouTube, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, but there isn't that community aspect behind that. And so the next step for us is developing a membership site. So basically, we want to create a family and a community that is then benefiting from another. A really cool community for people within our little niche is going to be a website. They will get early access to our podcast. You can access us, ask us questions, the community aspect. We have a forum there. You can ask questions, but also you can, you can lock your journey. There's also going to be courses on there, courses, presentations on different topics. Discount of past seminar footage. We will log our journey as well. We'll start vlogging. We're gonna have documentaries, our entire athletic journey. Furthermore, they get access to an exercise video library. The exercises that we love for hypertrophy and maximizing hypertrophy, we're gonna go through those in depth, telling you how to execute them. We kept them concise and also mobile friendly so that you can watch them in between your sets. I'm super excited to grow this community. The amount of value that we're gonna be delivering is huge. And I'd love you to be part of it. You will get so much out of that. I'll see you inside.